And, and David is uh, also a world of not expert on linkages between human factors and traffic control devices. Uh, thank you for being here. And, and thanks, Avi. Yeah, we're uh, happy to be here today. This is another one of the projects that our uh, lab, our respective labs have sort of collaborated on. So um, I'm Chris Monsier, I, um faculty at ASU. Uh, David Hurwitz, Associate Professor at Oregon State University again. And we had a big team, but two other people that we want to acknowledge before we get started. Uh, Sarisha Koturi, she's in the back here. She was uh, did a lot of work on this project. And then uh, Dave's PhD student, uh, Hisham Jashami, did a lot of the analysis too. So, so we're going to talk about um, the use uh, and driver comprehension of the uh, permissive right turn movements with the flashing yellow arrow. So you probably know all about flashing yellow arrows for left turns, which actually we just gave a presentation yesterday uh, on, the, on the PBIC webinar series about some of our older work that we did with left turns. Um, but this is new work that we've did with right turns. So using right turns for flashing yellow arrows are, is a relatively, I mean, it's been in the manual of uniform traffic control devices for a while, but there's not been a lot of installations. And so this was a project that we were looking at um, for the Oregon DOT. So if you've not seen a flashing yellow arrow for right turns, this is not actually in Oregon, and this video will kind of cycle through. This is in, this was in uh, Los Angeles, um, where I was at the NACTO conference, and I snapped a video. They have this working in conjunction with a bike signal, and I've cropped some other things out. But basically, the right turn arrow um, flashes yellow. Um, so our project was really looking at uh, do drivers understand what the flashing yellow arrow operation means for right turns? Um, and then it, can we get any um, safety or operational impacts or understandings of using that um, in a permitted or a protected permissive operation? So, um, so we actually did we did we came at this project in three ways, but we only have enough time today to sort of talk to you about two of them. I'm going to start with talking about the this driver survey that we did, um, and then uh, Dave is going to talk about the work that they did in the Oregon State. Uh, university driving simulator, and then we put those two pieces together uh, to kind of uh, both triangulate our results from both of those surveys, or both of the surveys and the simulator work. Um, we also did some work with some micro simulation models to sort of see what the operational impacts are, but we're not going to talk about those uh, today. Um, so our survey um, was a postcard mail survey, a random sample of 10,000 addresses, and we weighted it by uh, county population in Oregon, so we wanted a sample of Oregon drivers, and it was weighted by the by the county population. After we did an address cleanse um, to make sure that they were all mailable addresses, it was about 9,800, uh, uh, 9,900 9, postcard surveys went out. That's a picture of what the postcard was. Um, it went out. Uh, we didn't do any reminders. We just did one postcard mailing. One thing that we discovered as part of the study is that Bitly links the little thing that says driver study, this uh, blue link there, they're case sensitive. So if you type in lowercase driver study, um, it went to a paper at the University of Wisconsin, um, which, uh, which was unfortunate. We got a few calls about that um, um, and I had to correct it. But it, just remember that's one thing that we learned out of the project, bitly links are case sensitive. <laughs> Um, we did the postcards in 2016. We had a drawing for $100 Amazon uh, gift cards. Um, we got about a 4% response rate, so we got 400 responses back without. We didn't do any reminders. We didn't do any extra. Um, it was pretty well representative of, the, of geographically around the state, but it ended up being a, a little bit uh, uh, older population. Um, uh, the the uh, racial uh, representative representation, it was much more whited. And then the people that responded to the survey tended to have more education compared to the census survey. So um, it wasn't a 100% completely represented survey. So that also means that young people don't look at postcards, I guess is what we also find out. So, um, but most of the, not, nearly all the drivers were Oregon licensed drivers. Um, uh, two and a half percent of them were self-reported as colorblind. Uh, most of them had uh, lots of driving experience, and most of them drove a lot. Um, so, um, 
So you probably thought you would get away without a quiz, but you have to take a quiz as part of the as part of our presentation today. So uh, we are we are looking at a lot of we are looking at a number of options for the right turn display: the steady red arrow, the steady red ball, um, the green the steady green ball, the flashing yellow arrow. That was it, right? That's it. Yeah. Sounds right. Sounds right. So this is the kind of question that we started the survey with. Um, um, and it had this text down at the bottom that you could see better. Imagine you're approaching the intersection, the lane turning farthest to right and planning to turn right. What action would you take based on the current signal display? So I'll give you two options. Well, the first one is stop and stay stop until you get a green indication. The second one is stop and then proceed if there's no conflicting vehicles. So how many people vote for option one? And how many people vote for option two? Who many? Who didn't vote? You have to vote. <laughs> All right. Well, I could guess that it's probably going to be representative of what we found out in some of the other things. So we'll show you in a little bit. So one of the one of the issues is is that not all states' laws related to the red arrow is the same. So in uh, in the states that are in red. A right turn arrow means stop and stay stop until the green indication. So you can't turn right on a red arrow in the states that are in red. The states that are in green, the red arrow means the same thing as the red ball legally. You can turn after you stop. Um, so um, the MUTCD prefers the prohibited option. In fact, that's what the the um, the um, the vehicle code. Um, the general vehicle code uh, says, but each state obviously has their own has their own law. So for Oregon drivers, you notice that Idaho and Washington or Idaho and California have the the arrow means stop and stay stop. Our neighbor to the north and Nevada to the south have the same law as we do. You can the red arrow means the same thing as the red ball. Um, so we took um, that error coding and we were we we took those open-ended responses of those different traffic signal displays um, that people were shown. Um, the circular green, the green arrow, the circular red, the red arrow, and the flashing yellow arrow. And we coded them as correct, partially incorrect, or incorrect. And I'll show you on the next slide. You don't have to read all this text what the results are. But we were, we were looking for a couple of things um, in the responses. And we were, in the open-ended responses, we were uh, pretty, um, like we were not a good we were instructor you wouldn't like because we put we gave you we didn't give you full credit if you didn't describe everything perfectly so we put you in the partially incorrect category so for the green arrow um, if you didn't recognize if this if the text didn't indicate that that movement's exclusive because the green arrow means that you have no conflicting movements there's no peds moving there's no other vehicles moving and if you didn't write that in the open-ended response we counted that as uh, partially incorrect so that's that big gray area for the green arrow for the green ball, the circular green, the requirement is that you, you you still have to yield to conflicting movements, and often that is the pedestrian or a bicycle in the concurrent direction. And if the open-end response didn't say that they would look for pedestrians, we coded that as partially incorrect. In the flashing yellow arrow, what you see is about roughly the same completely correct responses, but, but um, much fewer of them, um, uh, more of them uh, indicated that they were um, that they noticed that the or that the that the flashing yellow arrow meant something about conflicting movement. So they mentioned pedestrians um, more often than they did with the circular green. And their errors that were incorrect were the stop before turning. So they they would some people just said, well, I would I would come to a complete stop and then make my turn. That's a fail safe response, um, which is from a traffic control perspective, even though it's incorrect, that's that's good. With the red arrow, which we, we didn't get the complete poll here, we have a lot of 50-50 split um, of people that said that whether it means stop and turn or stop and stay stopped. Um, and then the circular red was much more, um, nearly 80% of the folks um, responded uh, correct. Um, so, um, so those were the responses broken down. We also, and we also looked at, way back in the first slide, there was a little sign, a supplemental sign uh, that was, for right turn lane only. We also gave half the present, half the people that got the survey presentation got it with the sign and half of them got without the sign randomly. And you can see from all the bars, um, there's a slight bump 
um, in the comprehension with that supplemental sign um, for most of the responses. Um, after that open-ended responses, we asked some uh, we asked some multiple choice questions, and these just sort of reaffirmed a couple of the things that we determined from the open-ended responses. Um, but you know, the open-ended responses, you know, sometimes people didn't maybe not wouldn't have written everything that they that they would want to, at least in the multiple choice, they're being presented with the options. And so um, with the flashing yellow arrow, you can see lots, 76% of the folks uh, into, indicated the correct response that matched, and this is in the multiple choice, that matched their open-ended open -ended coding response. And then you see the same split in the multiple choice for the red arrow, right? 50% basically think it means one thing and 50% think it means the other thing. That's not good for a traffic control device. Um, but this is uh, sort of interesting. We also asked them, well, how sure of you are of your previous answer? And everybody, it's like Lake Wobegon, everybody was above average. So everybody was very confident or confident in their answer, even though the half of the answers were wrong. So, um, <clears throat> and then I think we just, we asked a basic question about, um, do you think that these displays are different? Um, and again, we sort of got that same response because people sort of know well, half of them think they're the same and half of them think they're different. Half of them are right, half of them are wrong. Um, but for the flashing yellow arrow, there was a clear understanding that this thing means something different than the green ball, even though legally they actually sort of, they actually mean the same thing. The flashing yellow arrow means proceed with caution after, you know, and yield to conflicting movement. The green ball also means the same thing. Uh, so they actually legally mean the same thing, but people understand the traffic control that the flashing yellow arrow is communicating something different to them. And we sort of established that that's because with the left turn arrow where people are most commonly associated with it, the arrows do mean something different to most people, right? You, you don't see a red, a red left arrow and turn, and turn left on it. You know what the green arrow means that you've got the exclusive movement and the flashing yellow arrow, at least in Oregon, the experience is pretty clear that people know that that means that I've got to yield to other traffic. Um, and there's a whole big long body of research that sort of supports, supports the flashing yellow arrow for left turn. To our knowledge, this is sort of the first work that's really looked in depth of the, the flashing yellow arrow. So our findings were um, good geographic coverage, older drivers a little bit oversampled, um, the expected driver behavior with a steady red arrow not well understood, but really comparing between the flashing yellow arrow and the circular green, both have good comprehension, but the flashing yellow, uh, the flashing yellow arrows incorrect responses were fail safe. Um, the circular greens partial corrects failed to sort of acknowledge that the that there was a potential for a likelihood of pedestrian, and but and they were recognized strongly recognized the circular green and the flashing yellow arrow were recognized in the difference. So the big conclusion from the survey is that people know that the flashing yellow arrow they associate that with understanding that there's a potential for a conflict with the movement that the arrow is indicating. So, um, so now Dave is gonna take over and tell you about what the simulator found out. So Avi, thanks so much for the introduction and Chris, fantastic job on the first half of our presentation. So armed with the knowledge that we gained from that diverse survey sample, we started coming up with designs for a simulator experiment to dig a little bit deeper into um, authentic driver responses. In order to do that, we leveraged the human in the loop driving simulator at Oregon State University. And this provides us a couple scenes from the lab's configuration. Our driving simulator is composed of a 2009 Ford Fusion. That vehicle sits atop a partial motion base. It's an electric pitch system. It pivots uh, plus or minus four degrees around a pivot point of the driver's eye. The vehicle is surrounded by 180 degrees of forward vision projected across three um, uh, 10 by 12 foot screens. And there's a rear view presentation as well. So if you're sitting in the driver's seat and you look out the center rear view mirror, um, you see the virtual world behind you. And if you look in your side view mirrors, there are little LCD screens that represent the, the virtual world behind you. And here's an example from one of our rendered scenarios, um, focusing on the presence of pedestrians traffic signal control, and so on. The experimental design that we moved forward with was a uh, factorial design that was fully counterbalanced and partially randomized. Um, when we think about the variables that were included, 
Um, we considered the signal head and the indications displayed, the geometry of the intersection approach, and the presence of pedestrians. So for signal heads, we honed in on um, some of those interesting comparisons that, that Chris just shared with you. Uh, the inclusion of the circular red, the solid red arrow, the circular green, um, a solid uh, uh, a flashing yellow arrow in conjunction with some alternative pedestrian indications. We thought that the length of the exclusive right turning bay might have something to do with the speeds and time to conflict measures that we would see as the vehicles interacted with pedestrians. So we added that into the experiment as well. And we wanted to see what happened when we placed pedestrians in the conflicting crosswalk. When we counterbalance all of those individual, individual independent variables and variable levels, um, we come out with the following experimental design. We randomly seeded each one of those scenarios into a particular location on a testable grid. Uh, we used six drivable grids for this particular experiment. Each one of those environments had four exposures. Four of those scenarios were presented in each one of those cases, and we randomized the presentation of the grid um, for each individual subject. When we look at the resulting designs, here are some examples of those rendered environments in the simulator. These are some of the cleanest visual environments we've produced. Um, all of this was developed uh, from hand using civil 3D files. And uh, these are the nicest signals that we've brought into the web. So those traffic signal heads and mast arms are all fully 3D and have quite a bit more capability than previous versions of traffic signals that we've played with. So we're really happy with the way that came out. Here's an example of one of those testable grids. This is the path that our drivers would um, execute um, as they were exposed to each one of their um, scenarios in sequence. So we would start right here in the middle of the network. We would be exposed to right turn. Oh, is that showing up now? Thanks very much. Always appreciate a little technical support. Uh, scenario number one, two, three, and four. Those are the right turns that we're collecting data at. And we space those out um, in time and distance in order to isolate the responses to those particular exposures. So how much data did we generate from this particular experiment? We brought 52 individual subjects into the laboratory. We only experienced five cases of simulator sickness. It's the one negative outcome that happens when you put folks in human in the loop simulation environments. They can become uh, nauseous and uncomfortable. Whenever someone experiences simulator sickness, we try and identify it as quickly as we can and exclude that data from the data set. That's a, a pretty low rate of simulator sickness. If you look at labs around the country, you'll see rates on the order of maybe 20% on average, depending on what you ask subjects to do. Of course, Chris and I have been pretty interested in turning movements at intersections. And the absolute worst thing that you can ask someone to do is make a 90 degree turn. So that's been problematic for some of the work that we've been doing. Um, we had a single calibration issue. And in total, 46 of those subjects generated a full set of usable data, um, which resulted in uh, 1,100 individual right turns that were observed. We recorded all sorts of different information, but some of the stuff we'll focus on today is a discussion of the visual attention that was recorded for those subjects at each individual scenario and their observed behavior. We, of course, recorded things like the position of the vehicle, instantaneous velocity, the position of other dynamic actors in the scene, like the pedestrians in the conflicting crosswalk, and we collected some comprehension uh, data in the form of post-drive surveys. So what does the visual attention data look like when we reduce it? Well, using our eye tracking equipment, we can record the eye movements that are presented from our subjects in the virtual environment. Um, we directly measure what are called fixations. Those are pauses at a particular location for a duration of a tenth of a second or longer. And then we calculate saccades, the pathways between those fixations. Those two movements, fixations and saccades, define our visual search task. So these images, those red crosshairs, are representing a record of a fixation. And we chain fixations in sequence to build a visual image of the scene around us. To analyze the data, one approach we take is thinking about areas of interest, targets in the visual field that we're particularly interested in. 
in an experiment like this, those targets might include the vehicular traffic signal heads, the pedestrian signal heads, perhaps a pedestrian in the conflicting crosswalk. And we think about how the visual attention is distributed across those areas of interest. So the first data set that we focused on was the coding of the actual driver responses. So we tried to produce a coding scheme very similar to the coding scheme that was used in the survey that Chris talked about a moment ago. There are some differences between self-reported responses and observed behaviors. So in the survey scenarios where somebody might say, I would stop and then go, when you're watching live action responses, we have to establish thresholds to define what stopped really means. Is a California stop, a rolling stop through a stop line, do we, do we count that? And at what speed does that start to become consistent motion? So we establish some criteria to define a, a correct response in the simulator, a partially incorrect response, or a fully incorrect response. And so we map those using a similar color scheme and, and schematic to the ones that were used in the survey and we generate the following results. And there's a lot of information here, but some of the key observations that I take away is the fact that responses to the flashing yellow arrow were very, very correct. Comparatively, responses observed in response to indications like the solid red arrow had lots of errors. And predominantly, those errors were stopping and staying stopped. So not recognizing that you could proceed through the intersection. So that's not necessarily a bad outcome from the perspective of safety, but if we're thinking about the operational performance of these signalized intersection systems, that's a problem because we're assuming that drivers are responding correctly to these simple messages. Okay, so how do, how do those behaviors relate to the visual attention observed in our different scenarios? Uh, this is an information dense, visualization. So let's talk about what we're seeing here. Uh, these are total fixation durations plotted across the vertical axis, and we've broken this down across all of our experimental variables. So we have visual attention on the pedestrian signal and on the vehicular signal, and we're also representing the signal indication that was present, either the circular red or the solid red arrow in either the 100-foot or the 50-foot turning bay. And as we look across this distribution of visual attention, um, one item that stands out to us is the overrepresentation of visual attention on the solid red arrow in both the 50 foot and 100 foot turning bay. Drivers are spending a lot more time looking at that indication. And when we pair that with the responses, we think it's twofold. Uh, we think part of it's derived from trying to understand what they're supposed to do in response to that indication in this particular context. And also the fact that a lot of these drivers waited for the indication to turn. So they were spending a lot of time looking at that indication stopped when they didn't necessarily need to be. Uh, how about comparisons of the circular green with the flashing yellow arrow? Uh, same visual representation, we're looking at the signals and the PED signals, the 100 foot bays and the 50 foot bays for two new indications. Here, what's particularly interesting to us is the decreased visual attention on the circular greens and the increased visual attention on the flashing yellow arrows. So when we overlap that with the behavioral responses, what does that mean? People glanced at the circular greens assumed they had the priority and went. They did not spend as much time searching, searching for the presence of conflicting pedestrian movements. On the flashing yellow arrow, when you map it to the behavioral outcomes, we saw frequent glances back and forth between the indication itself and scanning for other conflicting movements. So there's more attention because the drivers were scanning other areas at the intersection looking for potential conflicts. And we think that's a good thing. Okay, so how do we interpret the results of the survey and the simulator, both from the perspectives of comprehension as well as visual attention? Looking at the steady green arrow, or excuse me, the steady circular green, there's good correlation between the self-reported data in the survey and the observed behavior in our simulation environments. When we think about the flashing yellow arrow, um, there's also good uh, correlation between the results. The 
the only failures in comprehension, like Chris pointed out in the survey, were uh, increased yielding rates, stopping and waiting for protected indications, which we define as fail safe in the existing literature. When we talk about comparisons between the indications that require a driver stop, there's a little bit more differentiation between the survey results and the results in the simulator. For the steady circular red, we saw uh, higher rates of correct responses in the survey than in the simulation environment. And we think that some of those failed responses in the simulator were perhaps carryover effects from this uh, difficult decision making associated with the solid red arrow. So this atypical response and repeated exposure to the solid reds may have bled over into responses with the circular red as well. Then there's the feedback from the steady red arrow where we have consistent results, poor understanding across the board, um, and 50% of our survey respondents um, saying that they, the displays for the circular red and the steady red arrow mean the same thing. When we talk about the steady green arrow, um, there was some faulty decision making, but it's fail safe in nature. So like Chris discussed, the solid green arrow indicates priority and a lack of conflict, but there were instances where we had yielding that we would not have anticipated. Limitations from our two methods of survey uh, data collection and presentation in the simulator. Our survey sample was skewed a little bit, as Chris mentioned. It was a, a little bit whiter and a little bit more male and a little bit older than census data would leave us to believe for the population in Oregon. Um, we also had a slight uptick in respondents from Southern Oregon, closer to California, which if you recall, has an alternative definition for the solid red arrow, may have contributed to some of those observations. Um, hazards for interpreting the data from the simulator, uh, the, the, the classic implication for a counterbalanced factorial design is the potential for a feed and fatigue and carryover effects. So we tried to make the individual exposures, the driving tasks relatively short in nature, and we randomized them to minimize the impact of order on the presentation of variables. And we're limited in the number of scenarios that we can present. So we were only able to test in this instance uh, a maximum of 24 cases as our upper bound. So how do we translate this into recommendations for practice in the field? Chris is going to round us off. So, uh, so obviously one of the practice, one of the things that we would uh, like to recommend or know about is, you know, this inconsistency in the vehicle code about the red and red ball and the red arrow. And the approach we took with there is we gave almost this identical presentation to the Oregon Traffic Control Devices Committee, where they're the body in Oregon that um, uh, has jurisdiction over the definitions or the implementation of traffic control devices. The, the change in that definition would require, uh, you know, it's in revised statute, so it would require an act to the legislature. So we didn't we didn't go so far as to make any recommendation about that, but it's clear that why we we have this. Um, and there was a quite a bit of discussion when the MUTCD went with the definition of the of the stop and stay stop as the preferred definition. But there's quite a bit of infrastructure already in place uh, that's that's all set up, not assuming that the red arrow means stop and stay stop. So, so we didn't go so far as to put that uh, practice in. But um, we did, um, and this is now in going to be in the Oregon uh, Signal Design Manual, is that in these, you know, most of the places where the red arrow is used for right turns, it's in this operation called uh, protected permissive uh, right turn. So we abbreviate that PPRT. And so the, these are locations where you have a lot of right turning demand. You have an exclusive right turn lane and you basically overlap that right turning phase um, with um, concurrent movement. So you're trying to get more right turn movements through. So that's the most common place that people see the red, the red arrow. Otherwise, it's generally just a it's just a red ball presentation and probably not only your exclusive head. But in those operations where you might want to start thinking, and I have some graphics a little bit later on about thinking about the, the pedestrian movement in conjunction with that right turn movement, the flashing yellow arrow is the preferred, not the, 
well, we recommend that they include this as an option in their traffic signal design manual to, communi to communicate in those situations when the interval changes from protected to a permissive movement, the flashing yellow arrow does a better job of communicating that to drivers than going to a green ball. Because um, what we saw in the simulator and in the research in the survey is people just associate the green ball with go. And actually the only, the only uh, accidents or crashes that we had in the simulator with drivers and pedestrians were during the green ball. So the driver saw the green ball and just turned and ran over some fake pedestrians in the <laughs> simulator. Um, Fortunately, the human subjects, we were all cleared. Um, <laughs> so um, so the other, the other practices we, that we, so the, these are actually the, the signal designers on the team that was on the ODOT research project TAC. They mocked these up at the end and sort of preparing to include them in, the, um, in their signal design manual to give the, put the red, the flashing yellow arrow is an option in these protected permissive um, where the typical display uses this five section head with a yellow arrow and a green arrow and then back up to a green ball um, to allow this use of the flashing yellow arrow. Um, the other thing we, we, you know, this was sort of a recommendation that if you really are interested in that efficiency, um, it seems that there are a lot of drivers in Oregon, half of them in the survey and half of them in the simulator that don't know that they can turn right on red. And so there is a sign uh, that you can put up um, that communicates that you can turn right on that red arrow. So. Um, but anecdotally, I'm sure you've been in locations where people just sit at the red arrow. Um, it's not all the time, but uh, chances are about half the time somebody's going to sit and wait at that red arrow. Like we mentioned, that's not necessarily a bad thing. So we wrote that in the recommendations. Maybe, maybe you don't want to put this sign up. Having the driver stop and stay stopped at the red turn is safer for pedestrians. But where you're trying to get that efficiency of the right turn and there isn't a lot of pedestrians, you could consider putting this sign up. Um, so one thing that we weren't able to completely tease out um, is this is how to sort of how to make this make the operation work. So in the left turn operation, um, or many Oregon agencies have gone to what they call uh, with the permissive movement, the flashing yellow arrow have gone to this what they call a ped inhibit operation. So that when there is a pedestrian present and the pedestrian calls for service and puts a call into the operation or puts a call into the traffic signal they don't give the driver the permissive interval. They, they give them the green, usually it's running in the same protected permissive for left turns. They'll give them their protected movement. Then they'll let the ped go and they'll give the driver the red arrow. So they'll say, you know, drivers, you don't, you're not gonna, you don't get a permissive interval to turn over a pedestrian in the crosswalk. Um, if there's time left over, then they'll give the driver the permissive interval. Washington County has implemented this a lot of locations and uh, city of Portland, it's actually in the, the ODOT design manual as an option, a preferred option. So it's a smart way to think about, you know, we know that that is a key pedestrian crash type, left turning crashes over uh, a left turning crash into a pedestrian and a crosswalk. Same thing for right turns. We know that that's a, that's a common crash type as pedestrians because they're running, can, they're walking at the same time as the through and the right turns are going. So one option be, could be to run it sort of like the, the pet option would be to completely separate the movements. And this is where having the red arrow mean stop and stay stop would really allow you to do that. You'd have to now put up, you could do this in Oregon with, you'd have to put up a no right turn on red sign because the arrow means the same thing as a ball, but you could do the same thing. You could completely separate out the right turn from the walking peds. So when the peds are, when the peds are walking with the green arrow during the flash and don't walk, no drivers are turning right. And if there's time left over, you could display the flashing yellow arrow. But this is probably the more common operation between two and three, the choices to make, is whether to run the flashing yellow arrow over the walk and the clearance, or just, or uh, perhaps another choice would be to give the drivers the red during the walk, and then during the pedestrian clearance, the countdown time, the flashing don't hand, give the drivers the flashing yellow arrow. So there are two operations in Oregon that we know of, one in Washington County at um, Evergreen and Cornell, and then one in Corvallis at, on an ODOT facility at Van Buren and Third. The one in Van Buren and Third operates like number two, and the one in Washington County operates like number one. Um, they show the driver gets the red arrow over the whole pedestrian interval and then when it's done 
the flashing yellow arrow comes out. And they did that there because there are still, it's a long crosswalk and there's a lot of time. There are still some pedestrians that walk during the don't walk. And they thought putting the flashing yellow arrow up for drivers would help communicate that there may be some pedestrians walking in violation of the steady don't walk, but still uh, why not show the drivers the better indication that there might be pedestrians making that movement. So, so we tried to get at this at the research. It was pretty tough and we weren't able to answer the question about which way of two or three would be the preferred way to operate the flashing yellow arrow. Um, they, they sort of go in, in operation from, from clear safety and separation from this is the least to number one is the most. But one is basically, is not really with the flashing yellow arrow. It's a complete separation. Uh, it's kind of like a protected movement. So between two and three, two is sort of like a leading pedestrian interval for, for, for the right turn movement, giving that little window where the drivers get the red arrow while the ped walk is up. So still some more things to think about. Um, another potential operation is not in a protected permissive operation, but in a regular permissive interval uh, where you have a dedicated right turn lane um, and you have a separate signal heads for the right turn lane, or you could add one. Uh, rather than what we do now is show everybody the green ball, we could show the drivers turning right with a separate signal for them, the flashing yellow arrow. Because we know from the research and from the survey and from our experience with left turns that drivers associate the flashing yellow arrow with, I need to look for things um, and using it in this right turn operation in a permissive, completely permissive operation uh, would uh, potentially be something to consider. So, um, and that is kind of what the, the first video that I showed you at LA, that's basically what they're, what they're operating there. There's no reason that they need to show the flashing yellow arrow um, other than they're trying to communicate to the driver that that's a permissive interval. Um, and so I think it's something you're gonna start seeing a little bit more. Um, and so what I, you know, what I mean is that they would put, uh, gotta use this one, <laughs> um, you know, this signal head that's for the right turn lane, that would be the one that uses the flashing yellow arrow. And in our recommendations to ODOT, the, the three section head that they would allow uh, could be used. We recommended that they use the flashing yellow arrow in protected permissive operation, but also consider it or allow it in a permissive operation only. So it's, it's a little nuanced, uh, but it's definitely, I think some, uh, uh, a promising outcome from the work. Um, and I think we, um, you know, one thing that we don't know is, you know, Oregon was an early adopter of the flashing yellow arrow for left turns. We've had a long experience of using the flashing yellow arrows for left turn. It's back to about 01. Yeah. Using it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Even longer than that. Um, and so drivers are well conditioned to the flashing yellow arrow in Oregon. So we don't know if you'd get these same results in a state that didn't have a lot of current use of flashing yellow arrows, but it's clear in Oregon, uh, drivers associate the flashing yellow arrow with, with a permissive interval. So we had, uh, so this project was funded by, for ODOT, we had a great technical advisory team that were really engaged. Uh, a lot of the signal designers at ODOT, um, they were in the results with us um, making, a, making design recommendations, mocking up what they were gonna implement. So it was a really fun project from that perspective. Um, probably one of the best we've had. In oh gosh, yeah implementation right to practice. Um, when they have the figures mocked up for the design manual before you're done with the final report, that's usually a good sign. So, um, and we had good students uh, both at OSU and at PSU um, helping us crunch a lot of data um, and, they're, and they're listed there. Um, just for your, you know, I think that these, the PDF will go on the TREC website. And if you wanna get the full report um, in all, all its glory, you can um, download it there. There's more than we presented, obviously, in the report, in the final report. We mentioned we've given a couple of presentations. Uh, Dave was at the ITE meeting in Keystone, Colorado. Uh, Sarish and I gave a presentation at the Quad conference here for the ITE chapter. Um, and Sarisha gave a presentation at the TRB signal system in Flagstaff. We got a TRB journal article that's in the revision process right now, and we're working on a ASCE journal article on the survey aspect of it. And we have one more paper on the uh, looking at the uh, the length of the turning bays and the effect on sort of the severity of the of the conflicts with pedestrians, um, 
using some surrogate safety measures. Um, that's not in the final report. That's sort of bonus work that we're doing afterwards. So, um, so now time for questions. Jenny. Um, so I was wondering if there was any um, testing with, done with regards to those types of signs. If people were confused with the arrow, whether they should be stopped or not, whether that kind of sign, if it weren't implemented 100%, whether they would confuse it to mean that only the places where the sign was present was the ones where they could actually turn out or so. Yeah, Are, you want us to try and repeat that question? <laughs> <laughs> or is that, or is it, or can, my, I, that was good, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, we were pretty weak in our recommendation about that for that very reason. Um, so you can't you either put the sign up everywhere or don't put it up. Um, so we really kind of were focused on that, just on the places where you really wanted that efficiency. Otherwise, I guess you gotta, you know, we sort of created this situation where there's some confusion. I, I mean, I think when you really look at it, like why would the red arrow and the red ball mean the same thing when in every other display, it it means something, you know, it's a different display. Why should it mean the same thing? Every other thing we have set up, it's really the only thing left now that is the same. It's the different display. We require the same behavior. And that's really why I think the National Committee and the MUTCD is moved to that recommendation that the red arrow should mean something different than the red ball. Um, I mean, you use arrow, well, I'll let Dave jump in. About, you, want sure, to sure. About, you had another thing about sign testing. Yeah, we would, or did we answer all your... Okay, but you got to jump in? Uh, sure. Add? So uh, when we think about other arrow displays where folks have considered supplemental signage, the hope is that if we can isolate a simple and consistent message for a singular indication, just like Chris was pointing us towards, we don't need supplemental signage. So the, the, the classic traffic engineering example is if I need a sign to communicate the message I was trying to convey in some other way, we've already gone awry. Um, so work looking at the applications of a flashing yellow arrow for permitted left turns has tested with and without signage in a whole bunch of different ways. And the intention is we've, we've got a good indication if we don't need supplemental signage to convey the right message. Um, our problem here, I think, is inconsistent laws with neighboring states and lots of folks that aren't original to the state of Oregon. That, that combination of factors seems to be prevalent here. You're on a, you're on a traffic engineering hunt for things, uh, which I'm always on when I'm on vacation looking for odd things to take pictures of. There is a U-turn signal in the MUTCD. I've never seen one. Um, so there are three. You can have a red, green, yellow U-turn signal. Um, U-turns are another thing where in some states they're allowed unless signed, and in other states they're prohibited unless signed. So it's another one of these things. But there is this... Uh, a uh, lurking U-turn sign. If you find a picture of it, send it to me. U-turn <laughs> signal. I'd look. Hi, David. Um, how do we how do you incentivize safe driving behavior in a simulator setting? Sure. So we're, we're always interested in the validity of the behaviors that are observed, and we try and pick individual measures that are relevant for the scenarios our drivers are exposed to to validate their performance against. So in, in work like this particular effort where we're focusing on comprehension, the validation efforts come from big randomized survey samples where we can at least benchmark self-reported observations against observed observations. Um, in previous work that Chris and I have been involved in, we've looked at things like time to collision or post encroachment time between say turning vehicles and adjacent through moving bicyclists in the right hook scenario. So we're always looking for different measures that we can try and generate validation from. Um, we've done a lot with visual search tasks and naturalistic driving, a lot with comprehension, um, and, and a fair amount with uh, TTC and uh, post encroachment times. Yeah, I, mean, I think we you really don't see anybody like you know trying to run things over or and, and they don't know what we're searching. We don't, they don't know what the experiment is about. Uh, I guess if we talk about in all the experiments that we've run in the 10 years or so we've been doing this sort of stuff, the very first study we ever ran, we had two subjects out of 27 
that ran like 10 red lights in a row. And I, to this day, I, I can't explain why that happened. We've never seen anything like it uh, before or since, um, but it did make it into a, a TRR article. It's uh, interesting in and of itself. Uh, let's see, go Catherine and then. Yeah, similarly, I was wondering if even knowing that, oh, I'm filling out a survey or I'm a simulator, that inflated the amount of fail-safe preferences because even for the quiz i remember thinking like oh i would stop and go and then when you asked for hands i was like i would stay stopped as long as it takes um so i don't know if you could like video on this intersection and see how many people actually fail safe or um, Move along. So the, the body of work that Chris referenced for uh, flashing yellow arrows in the left turn configuration is about 20 years long. It goes back to work that originated in Texas. And there have been conflict studies at the onset of FYAs all over the country, and dozens of them, and thousands of surveys, and hundreds of simulator uh, participant responses. And we see similar patterns of behavior in both the, the, the field, the self-reported responses, and in the virtual environments. So it, it reads as pretty authentic to the body of literature in this particular area. It's a great question. Yeah, yeah in the, the prior work with the flashing yellow arrow, we did design the intersections because there was a specific set of intersections mm -hmm. questions. We did design them uh, based on the phys real physical intersections. And then we did do some video validation of both when the drivers yield and things like that. And we and it and it, it, it matches. Um, and so we did some of it. But for this particular one, we used sort of the our our balance of research time to explore this micro simulation because we feel pretty comfortable that the simulator is replicating um, real world behavior. I was just sort of along the same uh, questioning. Obviously, if a person is going into the simulator, they know they're being watched. So, do you think that like that would introduce some kind of bias into their behavior where, you know, maybe they, I know I'm being watched for something, I don't know what I'm being watched for, I'm going to be as careful as I can, like, because I know just personally sometimes you're kind of on autopilot and you're, you know, thinking about other things while you're driving and maybe real world behavior <laughs> is a little different than being in a simulator. Sure, it, it, it's an excellent comment. I, I think that Anytime we try and observe it, a phenomenon, we have the potential to influence it, uh, even when you go out into the world and make direct observations. For those of you who have done traffic counts before, uh, maybe wearing a vest and conducting a spot speed study has a huge impact on those speeds that you observe in the built environment. Um, so there's always the potential to influence an outcome. Um, as it turns out, the driving task is cognitively challenging and a divided attention endeavor. And so when you've had a long enough exposure, generally speaking, folks just tend to focus on the things they're being asked to do. It's not to say that it's a one-to-one -one mapping with the world. When we talk about validation, they exist in two ways, absolute uh, perfect responses in a lab condition, what you would see in the field, or um, uh, relative where the direction might be similar, but the magnitude of those responses changes. And there's absolutely the potential for there to be a deviation. And that's where the attempt at triangulating across different measurements between the field and other sorts of mediums comes from. So just another, you know, there's a, there's a number of other studies that sort of use a naturalistic driving approach where they basically instrument the car and there's cameras and all kinds of sensors over it. And then they watch people, you know, for long periods of time. And what they find is that initially you see people obviously aware that the camera is watching them. But then after some period of time, they forget the camera is there and they do some things. You're like, well, I guess they didn't think the camera was there. Um, you know, so it, you know, initially there is this, you know, there you do change behavior when you, you know, it's right. That's physics, right? So even just looking at something, right, supposed to move. Isn't that what electrons? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't that, yeah. Yeah. That's it. So we call them calibration drives. And so we run people through the operational characteristics of the simulator for as long as it takes for them to get comfortable. Generally three to five minutes in the lab 
and they aren't paying attention to anything except driving generally. And it's th those exposures in naturalistic driving are really short. Um, and then you see folks do all kinds of silly things when they know they're on camera. Um, so. And um, back to the survey photo, that is uh, that is one reason why we decided to like mock up uh, intersection because we didn't want people sort of looking and focusing on things in the photo that that we didn't want them to look at. And we were purposeful about the placement of a pedestrian in that photo. So there is no pedestrian on the near side. The flash don't the walk the walk was up. Um, the steady don't walk was up, but there was a pedestrian on the far side. Um, so we didn't want people to n sort of immediately see a pedestrian in that um, in the near side. Um, and the flashing yellow arrow did flash on the online survey um, was an animated GIF at the same flash rate that the that the intersection flashing yellow arrows flash at. So sure. So when you were describing how the uh, simulator experiment was designed, uh -huh. it was a goalie counterbalance. Yeah. And also says about factorials. Can you explain what, what that means? Sure, sure. So a factorial design is we have a series of independent variables. Those variables are stacked at different levels. And then every variation of each one of those variables is displayed against all the others. So in a two by two factorial design, there are four scenarios. We map all the levels against one another. Um, so every driver is exposed to every different level of every variable in conjunction with one another. Um, and then randomized, uh, in the case of a simulation trial with geometric characteristics, we only partially randomize it because the roads have to logically transition into one another. So some of this stuff is going to fall in a particular sequence. We break those sequences up into small grids. So four, five, six exposures at a time seated randomly across a series of different drivable grids that are presented in different orders to try and influence the sequence with which you're exposed to those individual scenarios. Yeah. The counterbalancing is mapping all the different levels against one another. Yeah, okay. so, so, so it's a within group specification. Every subject sees every variation of every variable, ideally in a randomized presentation. And when it's signal timing stuff, we can perfectly randomize those, but physical geometric characteristics and placement of heads, those require a, a quite a bit of pre-programming. So it limits the number of questions we can ask the simulator, because you know, we could do flashing yellow arrow and green ball. Um, we, can, we can only have so many levels of things to experiment, otherwise the drivers would be still driving in the simulator. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so technically we could do as much as we want, but those test drives would become multiple hour excursions and, and, and that has all kinds of consequences. Yeah. Do you have the online? Huh. Okay, online question. We like those. Um, so the online question was uh, whether you want the end of this, well, the survey and the simulation, whether there's any differences in behavior between uh, newer drivers versus more experienced drivers or other characteristics. Uh, so we're, we're doing some modeling now that looks at the demographic characteristics of the subjects in the simulator. Um, we, we don't have results to share about that yet. That's a great question. Yeah, in the survey, 95% of the drivers had 10 years more experience, right? It's biased older, so there really wasn't any new drivers in the, in the there, wasn't all, there wasn't any new drivers in the, hard to reach millennials, I guess, with post -marriage. The, the sample demographics in the simulator ranged from 18 to 70 on this particular experiment. Um, the average age was 40 from memory. I might have been 39, but right around there. How did you find the volunteers for the simulator? Sure, sure. Uh, we use a couple of different techniques. Those older subjects, there's a char life registry with a research program on campus that has contact information for, I think they're up to 900 individuals over the age of 50 who are willing to participate in research. So randomly connecting with some of those folks to get older subjects. Um, we have folks who approach us who are interested in trying to use the simulator and we incentivize participation. So folks come to the lab for about an hour, we compensate them $20 for their time. And that's uh, generally speaking, usually enough of a carrot to get folks to, to want to participate. Do you have the opportunity to 
do this all over again? Do you, uh, what kind of, what kind of uh, techniques would you do to get uh, a better turnout of like the driver survey? Like you said, the millennials didn't really respond mm -hmm. to those cards, which I get. I don't either. <laughs> Well, yeah. you could redo it with, with what would you do different? It sounds like a dissertation defense question. I can accept that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so on the survey, um, you know, what we decided to do, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Kelly Clifton, had just done a previous postcard survey and gotten a, she had gotten like a 7% response rate or something like that. She had a follow-up uh, survey. You know, some of it depends on what the topic is. If people are, you know, if it was a bike survey and I sent it out to Portland, I'd get a lot better response. But if it's a, you know, I think the question is like, you know, it's related to traffic signals um, and it went to everybody. So, uh, I mean, I I think, you know, uh, when, we, when we look at the literature of people who study traffic neural devices, there's only one other study that had more than 200 uh, samples, right, Sarisha? So one had a big, a big NTHRP study had like a couple thousand responses, but most of them were in the 200 ranges in the survey, you know, that's guided that work. So we felt pretty comfortable with a 400 response. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I probably reach out to survey experts um, and try and find it and think about a better way to can maybe try and connect. It's a, I think it's kind of a ongoing issue about how to reach people in this uh, mobile world. One of the things we liked about the postcard survey to seeded addresses was that we distributed the asks uh, proportionally to population based on DOT region in the state and where our agency here is the state DOT trying to get a representative sample geographically was important and I, I think we did pretty well with that so like with any other the experimental methodology there's some aspects that work out to our advantage and, and others that that are not and we're making trade-offs all the time about those choices. I think we, we did definitely like the geographic dispersion. Uh, we, you know, if we had sent out a survey link to a mail list, uh, we can't control where the people are from. Um, it could end up, you know, and there's things you can do, but, but we did like that, the geographic dis, uh, equity in the survey. Okay, one last question, I think. Yeah, also regarding the limitations of the demographics, uh, more than a bigger sample, uh, it would be interesting to go uh, at least part of the survey on the concept of uh, turning a white on red. It's, uh, even here in the US, for example, in New York City, you can't do right. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to see their response and how it would be more of an identification process for uh, that population versus the native population. Uh, yeah, I mean, a national survey would be interesting. It'd probably be even, it'd probably be even messier given the differences in the laws. Um, sometimes when I go to a new state, I don't even, I mean, obviously I'm like, I, I don't have that chart handy with me, so I don't know what the, what the law is for right turns or U-turns. So yeah, we would definitely see, you know, you would definitely see uh, more incorrect answers because of the, because the laws are different. And, and this is not the only traffic engineering, traffic control device standard that has variability across states in the US. So one foundational principle is it would be really nice to make some of those more uniform in nature, but it's politically challenging. Okay, thank you. Very much. Thank you.